So I don't, I don't, I don't need to wear the. Can you do you just talk like that? Yeah, they cracked. Okay, can you hear? Can you hear? Is it on? Is it on? Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I noticed I noticed last week that uh, some people were falling asleep. <laughs> so what I did is is anytime I see anybody falling asleep. I'm going to pull up that slide. <laughs> All right. And if I pull up that slide, you're going to have to name your favorite line from that slide. So we are going to study this. <laughs> Wait, do we need to do it? Yes. Huh? Wait two minutes? No way. No? no? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. And that won't go down. Now it's stuck. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a natural lever. No, both of them are Oh. Okay. No, you're right. But the point of that was good. It's a certain element. No, it's like, it's like the point of that was here, but not to leave it. Can you do a recap of what I missed if I didn't have to be here last week? Well, I will try to give you a very quick overview. Alright, so we started last week, we went over uh, Jewish life in the Iberian Peninsula during the Roman era and during the Visigothic era. And what we learned is that under the Visigoths, uh, Jewish life in Spain was quite hard. They enacted anti-Jewish legislation. There were, were various church councils that began to restrict uh, Jewish activity. The first forced conversion occurred in 613 under King Sisput, a Visigothic, a Germanic king. Um, and for about 200 years, Jewish life under the Visigoths was quite oppressive. We now turn to a different phase of Jewish history in the peninsula by looking at the rise of Islam. Now, Muhammad had, was born in 571 CE, and if I remember correctly, uh, he either died in 624 or 632 uh, CE. And shortly before his death, and in the decades that followed, Islam spread like wildfire throughout the Middle East. Uh, Muslims uh, started, of course, in, in Saudi Arabia, or modern-day Saudi Arabia. But very quickly, they spread throughout the Middle East, and they conquered the provinces of the Eastern Roman Empire. So, for example, at that time, Egypt, what we would call the Levant, which is present-day Israel, uh, Lebanon, Syria, were still part of the Eastern Roman Empire. Muslim forces quickly conquered those. They conquered what we would call modern-day Iraq, Babylon, uh, and then they proceeded eastward into what we would call Iran today. I believe it's the Sassanid Empire. Now, they were also extremely successful in the West. They conquered Egypt. They conquered North Africa. And by the beginning of the 8th century, by the 700s, they, there were Berber and Arab tribesmen that were making incursions into Spain. So if you ever looked at a map of uh, Spain and uh, North Africa, there's something called the Straits of Gibraltar. It's a very narrow passage. Um, so more Morocco, essentially, uh, present-day Morocco, is just across the river, shall we say, from, from Spain. So in 711, the... A large-scale invasion was launched by Muslim forces, uh, and they swept across the peninsula very quickly. Now, there's various reasons for that. Um, the Visigoths were not popular. They were not popular with Jews, of course, because the Jews had suffered under them. Um, and Jews were very ready to lend aid and support to the Visigoths, uh, to, the, to the Muslims, I should say, in, uh, against the Visigoths. Um, and then, if you think about it, if you're a lowly peasant who's a, a, a Visigoth, you really don't care at the end of the day who's king. You still have to pay your taxes. You still have to give your fealty, your loyalty to the king. So at the end of the day, you're only going to fight for the king to a certain extent. And then if, if they lose the battle, that's, that's the end of that. Now, from Jews, of course, there were numerous issues that linked them to the invading Muslim forces. On a religious side, Islam 
was, at least in the medieval period, considered to be much closer to Judaism than Christianity was. It's not until the later medieval period that you find a couple of rabbis who will actually state that Christianity uh, was not idolatrous, that it wasn't polytheistic. Uh, but at this stage, most rabbis would regard Christianity as polytheistic, at least for Jews. They, uh, there were some rabbis who were willing to say that Christianity was okay for non-Jews. The whole concept of, of shikuf, which is divine association, that's a topic in and of itself. So at the very minimum, Jews can look at Islam and say, well, it's a monotheistic religion. Um, there are also linguistic connections, of course. Arabic is a Semitic language. Uh, there's a Mediterranean culture connection uh, at some point. And there's also this, this deep uh, historical connection where Muslims, or at least you could say Arabs at, at some level, there's some kind of family relationship. So Jews could say, well, you know, it's not the best circumstance, but it's certainly much better than what we've had when the Visigoths were here. Um, now, from the Muslim perspective, Jews also presented uh, an advantageous ally. Why? Well, again, we have the similarity of religious practice, but the majority of the population in Spain, or at the Indian Peninsula, was, of course, Christian. So the Islamic armies that invaded were very small. They were very strong, they were very powerful, but numerically, they were very limited. So the first thing that they're going to look at is who can we align with that can be um, faithful, loyal to us against the dominant group. And of course, that dominant group would be Christians and Jews would be the natural ally. Now, there's something else to consider. Um, in, in Christian countries or uh, parts of the former Roman Empire that were Christianized, uh, Jews were the main minority. You know, they, were, they were it. There may have been some radical sects among Christians, but Jews really drew the attention of the Catholic Church or the emerging church and of the government. In Islamic countries, there were many different minorities. There were many different types of Christians, Christians that followed, you know, Eastern traditions, Western traditions. There were Christian heretical groups like the Mandaeans, the Manicheans, many different kinds of groups. There were still remnants of Jewish Christians that still existed. Um, and of course, there were Jews. And, and by the uh, ninth century, there were different kinds of Jews. There were Karaites, there were Paraim, there were, you know, Rabbinite Jews, Rabbinic Jews, there were Samaritans still. If you go farther to the east, there were Zoroastrians, and even in uh, present-day Iraq, there were still religions that dated from the time of the Bible. People still, still followed Bel and you know the variations of Marduk and all these kinds of things. So there were many religions with which Islam had to contend. So in some sense, they could deal with minorities. They could deal with a lot of different people that were used to that. All they wanted was, of course, fealty. And if you were a member of the Dimi class, which were the people who were part of the people that were both, you had to pay a special tax, so Christians, Jews, and other, what we would call today heretical groups, but they were different flavors of Christian, uh, would have fallen under this protected class. So they were second class citizens, but they were protected, they were allowed to practice their religion. So from an Islamic standpoint, you know, Jews were a natural ally, and Jews looked at Islam much more favorably. Now, Islam made very fast incursions, as I mentioned, from the east to uh, North Africa and into to the peninsula. Um, the, the Muslim forces fed very quickly throughout most of the peninsula into France until they were stopped in 732 by a very famous individual. You may have heard of him in your uh, college or- Charlie? Uh, no, his grandfather, Charles Martel. So uh, in 732, there was a, a battle that was fought, and it basically put an end to the expansion uh, goals of, of Muslim forces. Uh, his grandson was Charlemagne, Charles the Great, who, who founded the, the Holy Roman Empire. So the only place that there was some measure of uh, resistance, if you, if you notice here, I've got the little arrow, it's the northern part of the peninsula, that gray area. There were Visigoths that essentially journeyed northward and they basically, they're not very mountainous regions, uh, areas like the Basque region that you've probably heard about and, and used. Uh, they were able to survive and able to keep the Muslims at bay. And this became the seed from which the later medieval kin kingdoms, uh, Christian kingdoms came about. So we have the kingdom of Leon, we have the kingdom of Castile, the kingdom of uh, Navarre, Aragon, and they sometimes they change names, sometimes they merge, et cetera, but these kingdoms are all that's left of an independent Christian uh, entity. And eventually they will grow stronger as Muslims grow weaker. 
and they'll begin the process of reconquering the peninsula, and that's called the Reconquista. So this is something that, that continues for about 800 years. So the Muslims were in Spain. The one, sir? And eventually taking this out. Yes. So the Muslims arrived in 711, and the last Mu independent Muslim kingdom exists until 1492. It's a very long period of time. Um, the, now, Muslims continue to have a history after that. The Jews are officially exiled in 1492. Of course, there are conversos, uh, crypto Jews, that continue to exist. Muslims are, are allowed to stay um, when the Kingdom of Granada is conquered. We'll go over that in a second. Um, but they also undergo a forced conversion. Um, and they, these forced converts are called Moriscos. It's like a, sort of the equivalent of conversos. Uh, and sometimes the word converso was also used for, for, for Muslims to convert it. They actually stay in Spain until uh, 1609 when those individuals are actually forced to leave uh, completely. So even though the Moriscos are now officially Christian, they are exiled. Now, Jews who have converted to Christianity were not forced to leave, although many of them did. So you have even, even within Christian culture, you have a distinction between Jews uh, and Muslims. So this gives you a little bit more insight into the extent of uh, Islamic control. And you have the Kingdom of Leon and the little bitty piece of Castile, which eventually becomes the massive part of the peninsula. Uh, and then this kingdom is uh, Pamplona, which eventually uh, becomes part of the Kingdom of Aragon. So when the Muslims come, they find that they have a, a, a good partner in the Jewish community. As they're marching forward into battle, they lead Jews in charge of cities, and, they, and Jews begin to serve uh, in key positions of the Muslim uh, government that is emerging. So over a period of time, uh, when Islam first spreads out across uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and eastward, the center of the caliphate, which we hear a lot about these days, is in Syria. So there's actually, if you think about it, the reason that ISIS picked Syria is actually very strategic. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were getting into history. They wanted to go back in time and reestablish the caliphate, which theoretically controlled this huge landmass. Exactly. So they're hearkening back to the days. Uh, in the 21st century, they're looking back to this, this time period where Islam was dominant. Uh, there are political things that happen within Islam, uh, just like in any other culture. And the caliphate uh, breaks apart. And some of the key players move westward into Spain. So Spain, or the peninsula, becomes this independent caliphate. And Cordoba, uh, which is right here, right there somewhere, you can see it. Uh, middle, in the middle right there, in the area that's called Andalusia, is, uh, becomes the heart of the, this new caliphate. Now that's advantageous for Jews for various reasons. The Islamic government wants their new caliph, uh, caliphate to become the center of learning, uh, science, literature, writing, poetry, etc. And so, so what do the Jews do? Well, they say, well, we're going to take advantage of them. You know, uh, that's very advantageous to Jews because they can serve in the positions that benefit Muslim empire, the Muslim empire, but they can also produce a society which benefits from that. They have tolerance of religion. They have tolerance of uh, knowledge. Um, and with their linguistic skills, with their connections throughout the Mediterranean, they become key players uh, to this growing uh, Islamic kingdom. Well, this is the golden age of Islam, right? It's the golden age of Islam, and, and it's no coincidence that uh, what we call the golden age of Jewish Spain occurs roughly at the same time. Now, the Muslims entered in, in Spain, as I said, in 711. They really don't reach the type of uh, uh, majesty that we talk about until the 10th century. So we're talking about the 900s. And it's simultaneously when the Jewish community really begins to flower. Uh, there's an individual that I had mentioned before. I, I don't have a sheet on him, but uh, these are just some coins from the Emirates at that time. His name was Hazdai or Hazdai Ibn Shaprut. Uh, the word Ibn is the Arabic equivalent for Ben, for son. And you can see uh, Jews taking on this Arabization even, even, you know, even Ezra, for example, Moshe, even Ezra, Abraham, even Ezra. Uh, they they begin to dress like Arabs. They speak Arabic. You know, uh, you know, Parmenides, Rambam's, Miranda, the theme is written in Arabic. Uh, you know, Yehuda Halevi, all these individuals. They're very highly painted with the Rambam. also wearing turban. Turban. I mean, they they look the part. There's a familial connection. There's there's an ethnic connection, if you will. 
Um, so this Kazai Ibn Shafrut, like many famous Jews in history, was a physician. If you ever want to be important, you want to be a physician. Uh, because nobody's going to argue with you at the point of death, are you Jewish or Christian or Muslim with your physician, you're your, your side. So Hazai Ibn Shafrut is a physician, and he becomes the court physician to a very important individual whose name is Abed Ed Rahman III. He's the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, successor to the individual who creates the Omeyyad dynasty in, in Spain. And he, uh, Hazai Ibn Shafrut becomes a vizier, like an advisor, a secretary to this very famous Khalid. So in his position as uh, advisor, Hazai Ibn Shafrut is able to protect the Jewish community. And he's also able to gather scholars uh, from the Jewish community to Spain. Now, at the same time, uh, how many of you have heard of the famous yeshiva in uh, Babylon? Okay, no, not in Jewish. <laughs> okay, so we haven't heard. Okay, so in the medieval period, there were Babylon was a center of Jewish land. So we have, of course, the Jerusalem Talmud, the, or as it's called, say, the Palestinian Talmud. But we have the Babylonian Talmud, the Babli. The Babli is really the, the Talmud that we follow. This is the product of rabbis that lived in Babylon. The, the centuries of Jewish life in the Second Temple period were Babylon, the land of Israel, and Egypt. And then, of course, the Jews scattered in other places. So Babylon, especially after the destruction of the Temple and the exile of Jews uh, after the destruction of the Temple and after the Bacchus uh, rebellion, Babylon becomes even more important. These are where the scholars go. They are the ones who put the Talmud together. Uh, and there are two yeshivot that are very prominent. There was a third one uh, that sort of fell by the wayside. The first one was Nehardea. Uh, the second one was uh, Sura. And the third one was Kumbadaita. Kumbadaita, if, if you remember your history, well, not your history, but your current events during the Iran War, there was a city that was taken several times by Marines, and they would leave and they would come back. It was the city of Fallujah. It's very hard fought, very... Uh, very bloody. Uh, it was a very costly American uh, battle. Fallujah is the site of Kumbadaita. So, so when the Muslims talk about Fallujah being a holy city, it was actually a holy city for Jews as well. So these yeshivot were there in Babylon, and this is where the Geonim, the great rabbis, came from. And what they would do is they would legislate, they would send out rabbinic responsum, or response of plural, to all the diaspora. So if you're living at the edge of you know, Iran or something, and you have a question, they would write a letter and they would send it to the great Yeshivot in Babylon. And the rabbis, you know, the great uh, Fachamim, they would respond. And they would do so for other communities throughout the Mediterranean. So what happened eventually is uh, politically, the situation in, in present day Iran, or then Babylon began to decline, and those Yeshivot began to decline as well. And they began to send out um, representatives throughout the diaspora, basically collecting funds. And that becomes a key uh, component. This is the great synagogue in Corpola. Uh, we call Moorish architecture, very, very impressive, very beautiful. Now, I think I wanted to say one thing. Uh, no, in, in uh, Corpola. Yeah. So one thing about Islam is we probably know that uh, painting pictures of people is not acceptable. Uh, it's, it, when it's, they, when they are anti-icon or anti-image, they take that very seriously. So if you notice, a lot of the architecture that they make is very ornate, very beautiful, very intricate, geometric. And the reason for that in part is because they don't paint faces, they almost transfer that artistic element into architecture, into this very beautiful lattices, and very beautiful. In the same way, Islam transferred this lack of uh, painting, if you will, beauty of, of art, uh, artistic beauty, they transferred it into language. So the Muslims were actually some of the first grammarians. Uh, the Muslims during the, the spread of Islam throughout the Mediterranean and Near East and so forth, they rediscovered uh, the great classics of Greek literature, Aristotle, Plato, uh, Socrates, et cetera. So they just rediscovered all these things. They rediscovered scientific texts, medical texts, and they, they, they love that. They, they thrive in it. They begin to uh, develop grammar, dictionaries, things of nature for, for Islam. And as a consequence, at the same time, you see Jews beginning to develop grammarians and poetry. And many of the famous individuals that you, that you know of uh, were actually born during this time. 
and they are brought to Spain, uh, some of them as a consequence of Kazai Ibn Shaprut. Now, who are some of these individuals? So the first one I mentioned is Kazai Ibn Shaprut, the uh, Dr. Shaprut. And what he does is he says, I'm going to do what uh, the Khalif does, I'm going to bring scholars to Spain. At the time, uh, there was an individual, he's down on the list, uh, the fifth one, Moses ben Hanok. Moses ben Hanok was a rabbi who was a representative of the Yeshiva book in, uh, in Babylon. So he's, he's out in the diaspora collecting money, and uh, I think he's taken captive by pirates, and then he's eventually uh, ransomed, and he winds up in Spain. And Hadi uh, Ibn Shaprut said, well, why don't you just stay here and set up a yeshiva, and uh, we'll support you. And so what happens is, in Spain becomes a Talmudic center as the yeshiva in Iraq are beginning to decline, and now they actually have Talmudic teachers that can actually transmit. There's a story that when Moses, uh, Moses Ben Hanof was uh, rescued, uh, you know, people wanted to know who he was. He sat down in a uh, Talmudic lecture, and the, the individual who was teaching was doing his best. He was a rabbi, but he was a very well versed. And then Moses Ben Hanof interjected and said, Oh, this particular Gemara means this, 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 and this. And everybody was astounded. And then they realized that what they had was one of the students, one of the, the Hakamim, from Babylon. And so he became the head of uh, the issue that was established. And so Spain now began to have its own independent, the same way that the Muslims had their own independent caliphate. Now Jews had the ability to legislate, to uh, instruct without having to go send emissaries to Babylon to get preventive responses. Now they have their own people. And as, as often as the case, uh, one individual attracts another individual. So, um, Let's look at this guy, Sol Solomon Ibn Gabiro. Uh, he's a little bit later, but he's important because uh, what, what did we sing in the morning? We sing the Adon Olam. And the Adon Olam is written by who? By Solomon Ibn Gabiro. Gabiro was a philosopher and he was a poet. Uh, we often forget uh, a lot about these guys. Uh, Dunash Ben Labrat was brought to Spain by Hazan Ibn Shapru. Uh, you know what's, what uh, Zemmer? That the Nashram of Rockbridge. So there is a Zemmer, uh, 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 I don't know if you've heard it. Uh, okay. Anyways, it's in the, in the, in the, in the Sidor and in the uh, adventure. Uh, he is a poet and a, you know, he composes these beautiful, uh, and we still sing his songs today. Uh, Moses Ben Hanoch, uh, as I mentioned, Bachya Ibn Pakuda. Is that he writes the Tavot, uh, the Babot, the duties of the heart, a philosophical, philosophical work which mirrors Islamic, yeah, uh, you know, thought. All these individuals are ultimately influenced in one way or another by Islam or by the philosophical trends that are present because of Islam bringing these back into uh, the fray. Uh, Abraham Ibn Ezra and of course Moshe Ibn Ezra, great biblical commentator. Uh, Shmuel Hamagid is a very interesting individual. Um, in the 11th century, um, the Umayyad dynasty begins to break apart, like anything. There's political issues, the central authority of Cordoba breaks apart, and there are what's called taifas, which are city-states. So these independent city-states, uh, every city has its own government, uh, and everybody's vying for control, and this is actually how the Christian kingdoms are able to begin the process of reconquest because the Muslims are divided among themselves and the Christians are able to capitalize on that. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So Shmuel uh, Hanagi is like the 1030, 1056. He is probably the most influential uh, Jew that lived in Spain uh, in any era in history. His other name is Shmuel, Samuel. Hanagid is the prince. Uh, some people say his real name was uh, Nagrela. Uh, Nagid is, is the prince because he became the vizier, if I remember correctly, of the kingdom of Granada. So he becomes the top general and the top, uh, essentially, viceroy, if you will, for this kingdom, which was unheard of in any time in Islam, in any time in the Middle Ages. To have a Jew in that position of authority, uh, he was also a rabbinic scholar, he wrote poetry. 
Um, and they also had a spice shop. I thought the Vegas was like that. Um, so if you have a spice shop, you'll become great in the law. So he becomes extremely influential. Um, but this is one of the things that we have to know about Islam. In the book, if you've read, you notice that even though Islam provides a fairly stable environment for Jews, it is not devoid of, of uh, violence against Jews. Now, the violence is different for the most part than it is in Christian kingdoms. In Christian Europe, the violence is theological. So the anti Semitism flows from this issue of are the Jews rejected by God? Do they embrace Jesus? Do they embrace, you know, reject Yeshua? Well, this is the, the theological basis. The Jews are subversive, they are antagonistic, they are undermining you know, the, the gospel. But in Islam, even though there's a competition between Jews, uh, Judaism, and Islam, uh, the violence that is perpetrated against Jews is often more of a social and economic uh, nation. So what happens is, uh, Samuel Hanagi reaches this very prominent position of authority, uh, and his son, when he dies, his son comes to power, his name is Joseph. And many, there's, there's some opinions that maybe Joseph was a little bit too mindful, maybe he wanted his position too much. Whatever the case, other Muslims did not like that. They're like, this is unacceptable. The Jews are supposed to be beneath us. And what they do is they strike out, they kill Joseph, and there are a series of violent uh, acts that are committed throughout the community. Um, and there are also different types of Muslims, which we'll, we'll see, that are not so um, tolerant. Uh, and if you want to interrupt, just was it in the city of Fez? Because I saw the book that the city of Fez was attacked multiple times. That, uh, well, Fez is in Morocco. Uh, so, in some sense, I think you can sort of look at southern Spain and Morocco as like sort of one entity. Um, but they're, they're different circumstances, but they sort of overlap. So, there's sort of violence that sometimes is ignited and spreads, you know, to other things. The Moorish violence in Morocco. Was often more murderous than in central and northern Spain. Right? Like there was more forced taxation and, and like taking of property was a little parts at first before the destabilization of the Palestinians. Right? Yes. So what happens, and I think we'll get to that slide in a second. Um, by the middle of the 11th century, so we're talking about well, a little bit beyond that. And by 1085, the Christian kingdoms are really on the move. And they have taken Toledo. Toledo is in the middle of Spain, it was the ancient Visigothic capital. So the Muslim, the, the Christian forces are really taking advantage of the fact that Islam is divided. Um, and by the, by the middle, by 1085, they're already at Toledo, and they're about to keep going. And this is where we sort of transition into another Islamic group, which has uh, a very different attitude toward, towards Jews. Um, let me just mention Yehuda Halevi. Uh, I'm sure you know, uh, he wrote the Kuzari, um, and he's a poet, uh, rabbi as well. The Kuzari, and I'm not sure if you know about it or not, but uh, it's about the Kuzar kingdom uh, in the um, Caucasus area of, I guess you would say, the former Soviet Union or the present day, whatever, whatever Tajikistan, whatever it is today. Um, and the Yehuda, the, what? the Western States. Yes. Uh, so Yehuda Halevi uh, writes this book, the Kazari, as a philosophical work, and he talks about this Kazar kingdom, which did exist, um, and the top leaders of the kingdom, the king uh, converted to, to Judaism. We don't know that that really flowed down to the average person, but we know that the top families converted. And in it, he writes this philosophical discussion about why the king chose Judaism over Christianity and Islam. And it's sort of funny, I mean, I, I think it's sort of cliche, but in essence, you know, the argument is he goes to the to the imam and he says, if you had a choice, um, of course, making it very simple, would you choose Judaism or Christianity? He says, oh, I would choose Judaism or Christianity. And then he goes to the Christians and says, well, if you had a choice and you had to be one or the other, would you choose Christianity or would you choose Judaism? So, well, of course, I would choose Judaism. So then he's like, okay, well, we got two out of three, so that, that makes it for me. But um, so Yehuda HaLevi is alive during this time. Uh, Benjamin Tudela was a uh, famous traveler. Are the Ben Ezra's related to those brothers? I think they were cousins, if I remember correctly. I think there was there is a family connection, if I remember correctly. But they're not brothers. But no, that no. means like son of. No, no, no. Yeah, they're just just by putting their together. I think there is a family connection. Yeah. Right. But they're not they're not brothers. No. Um, Judah Ben Saul, even Tibon. Um, 
kind of what he did. Uh, I think he was a rabbi that made it into France, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure why I selected him. And of course, the apogee of, uh, of Jewish life in Islamic Spain is under the Ramah. So this is really the high point of Jewish life. And it's really at this point where we have the, um, I guess you could say, the coalescence of political and religious issues that, that really change and, and begin to point us uh, in a, into the Christian era, I guess you could say. So this is, once the Khalifa breaks apart, uh, you start having all these little bitty kingdoms. You know, one time it's all one, one section. You can see the kingdom of Leon in the north is starting to expand. Uh, you can see the kingdom of Bambona that's starting to move southward. Um, and so the Muslims, their division is always their problem. That's like, I think it's probably perennial. Yeah. It's always, yeah, exactly. So they're, they're not able to coalesce and they're all divided. And just out of history, you know, some of you may be familiar with Spanish if you've heard of El Cid. This is the time frame of El Cid in, in uh, Valencia, uh, which is another story. Um, What's up with no man's land? Well, no man's land is really the point um, between where the kingdoms, you know, one of the Muslim territory is off and the Christian territory. So it's something that, you know, yes, but by, this is 1031, but by 1081, um, I don't have a, they're already like in this middle area. That's where Toledo is. Now that Toledo is sort of this broader area, but there's an actual city. And that was the ancient Visigothic uh, capital. So the Christians were able to make inroads because the Muslim city-states were more than each other? Yeah, so that at one time there was one, uh, Cordoba was like the center. They had control over everything. Then they break apart and every city is like on its own. So you have Muslims making deals with Christians and their allies. And then sometimes the Christians think, you know, are against other Christians. And then Muslims will say, well, I'll help you against the Christian yeah. kingdom. So, you know, the, the kingdom of Leon may be fighting the kingdom of Barcelona, and they'll, they'll tell the guys in Badajoz, hey, you guys help us out. And so there's this constant back and forth. Everybody's against everybody. Um, and one thing that, you know, Julian mentioned that, um, he said this is right before the Crusade. We often think of the Crusades due to the Holy Land. But from a, from a Christian perspective, the Crusades were also happening in Spain. The Reconquista is part of this religious reconquest. So they look at Islam as a threat in the East, and it's also a threat in the West. And so you could be a knight fighting in the Holy Land, but you could also be you know, in, the, in the steps of you know, Spain fighting the Muslim. And when did the Caliphate break apart? I think... Uh, the death of the Caliph. Yeah, I think it was the death of Caliph, and then it's one family line and so forth, which is basically what happened with the Caliphate in Syria. Yeah. And that's why you yeah, had that's a what happened with Muhammad. That's why there's always Caliph Alexander. Yeah. Was Madrid? No. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, yeah, it was in North of that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I know it's not a city. I just ask because my family, Used to have a sword in Cuba from the, the 15th, 15th century. Uh -huh. It was forged in like, the kingdom of Oh, wow. And I don't remember. By that time, it was in the the political city. Because my family's from Madrid. And I don't know what part. By that time, it would have been under the, Cast the kingdom of Castile by the 15th century. Um, so you can see some of the disorder. Yeah, it would have been several hundred years. So then uh, we'll go to the next slide. So now what we have is um, when the Khalifa breaks apart and the Christians are making inroads into uh, you know, taking over Muslim land, there is a group of Muslims that uh, arises. There's two groups. The first is called the al Mubarids, and the second group, which directly impacts Maimonides, is the al Muhadis. The al Mubarids are the first ones who come on the scene. And they come basically to the rescue of Muslim, uh, Muslims in Spain because the Christians have taken Toledo and they're on the move and they're going to keep on going. And if it wasn't for the Almobarids coming in as reinforcements from North Africa, from Morocco, the Christians probably would have pushed the Muslims to the sea. But they were able to stop them. There's a famous battle called the Battle of Zaraka. Now, according to tradition, we don't know if it's true, there were 40,000 Jews who fought on the Christian side. 
So it's interesting. Uh, whether there were 40,000 or not, you can already see that there are Jews sort of caught between these two competing forces, and some are fighting on the on the Jewish on the on the Christian side, and some are probably fighting on the Muslim side. So the Almohadids are much less tolerant than the Muslims that came before them. There is some initial violence, um, and they have much more, much harder line against Jewish communities. But the individuals who are the most violent is are these Almohadis. This the, is not during the Crusades. Yes, but now we're now we're uh, Maimonides was born. So we're going sort of super fast. We have so much history. Uh, Maimonides was born in 1135. So uh, no, yeah, and he died in 1204. So the Almohades. The, the word Almohad means uh, like unity. So these these guys are they they pride themselves on being the true monotheists. So they don't even like other Muslims. They you know if you're not it's it's like ISIS. I always think of that. If you're not like us, you know, even the Almohades, which were religious fanatics, they're not. It's, it's almost like I read a report that said that Al Qaeda was telling ISIS that they were like too radical. And I was thinking like, like yeah, ISIS was, like, was an element of Al Qaeda, and then Al Qaeda, the majority of the Al Qaeda leadership were like, you guys are too extreme for us. Yeah, yeah, one terrorist telling another terrorist that they're too extreme. So Almohadas are like, the Almohadis are heretics, and the Almohadas began to go through a systematic persecution of Jews in North Africa. Um, and they actually forced Jews to convert. And this is where Maimonides is writing to communities and saying, if you have converted, but you're, you're assimilating, you're pretending uh, to be a Muslim, but you're, you're actually keeping them exposed to the best of your ability, then there is a hope for you. And you should try to escape this as soon as you can. But God honors what? Well, because the arguments about that, they, the belief system in both of these religions wasn't true idolatry. And so you're not, like, for the laws of the Quach and Fesh, you're not violating Abol Azara. You're just putting on a shifted kind of a mask to protect yourself. You're still you're saving life without committing true idolatry. Exactly, because in Islam, there's something called the Shahada, which you know you're familiar familiar with it. I'm sure uh, you know there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You recite that you know multiple times, like three times or something. Then technically, you are acknowledging the sovereignty of Allah and uh, Islam as a true religion. So my mommy's argument that uh, that Julian is uh, alluding to is that unlike Christianity, where the individual had to undergo baptism. Or actual uh, you know, rituals where they would partake of the, the Eucharist. In Islam, it was a verbal statement. And so my mind is like, you know, it's, it's not the good, but they're, they're only saying something that is with the mouth. You're only lying about the one part. You don't believe Muhammad's a prophet. Saying it three times to save your life isn't a big deal. Saying there's no God but Allah is not a lie to the Jew because the word Allah is. The Arabic word for God. It's the same that Maimonides wrote when he wrote anything in Arabic. So there, there was no question about whether or not there was idolatry because it wasn't. It was just a matter of I'm going to lie and say I'm a Muslim now so that they won't cut me down. So the uh, the Almohadas invade, and this is why Maimonides only lives about 12 years uh, in Spain. And his family then uh, flees to Morocco and then eventually to make it to uh, outside of, uh, they, I think they go briefly to the land of Israel and then they wind up in Fossat, which is outside of modern day Cairo. So, um, so this is just a picture of the Alhambra. Uh, it's a beautiful palace in Granada. Um, it was, uh, what happened is as the, as the Christian forces made progress through the peninsula, Muslim forces began to withdraw, and then the last part that they controlled was called the Kingdom of Granada, and that lasted all the way until 1492. Now, from the roughly from the middle of the 14th century, which would be the 1300s, for the next 150 years, they were a vassal state of the Kingdom of Castile. So they they were an independent kingdom, but they had to give homage. They had to uh, essentially. Yes, sir. Tributary. Tributary to, to the kingdom of Castile. So they were still independent. They still had wars. They still fought, fought sometimes with, with uh, the kingdom of Castile, with the kingdom of Aragon. But it was a much reduced state, and they would continue in that capacity until uh, the end of the 15th century. So just some 
picture of that. And this is inside of it. This is sort of that very beautiful architecture. So we have sort of touched on this, but I wanted to show you some maps that show the gradual uh, expansion of Christian control in the peninsula. So right now, this is 1030, which is sort of the time frame that we were talking about until the uh, early part of the 12th century. So Christians only control the, the upper portions of the peninsula. By 1210, they already have most of the peninsula. So here, on the western part, you can see the Kingdom of Portugal. Uh, this is still Leon, this is Castile, and then this is, I believe, Navarre, and then this is uh, Aragon. So now you can see they control about half the peninsula. So they're making very, very good progress, at least from their perspective. And then by the time that we get to the middle of, uh, was it 1274? I think uh, I covered what that up. What happened to Leon? Huh? What happened to Leon? Leon was incorporated into Castile, so it was merged into. So by the middle of the 1300s, uh, the Kingdom of Castile has taken basically the center portion. You have an independent kingdom of Portugal, uh, which is what we have today. And then in the north, there's still the small kingdom of, of uh, Navarre, and then there's the kingdom of, of Aragon. As the Muslims, this is now into, I think, the second or third crusade. Well, around the 1300s. Yeah, uh, it's probably like the fourth or fifth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So as as the, the Almohades and the Almohades persecuted Jews, now we have a change um, in the Jewish situation. So before they wanted to flee the Christians because the Christians were persecuting them and they wanted the Muslims. But now that the Muslims are persecuting them, now the Christian kingdoms which are on the move are open armed toward Jews because they look at Jews as a strategic uh, component in their quests, right? They, they have uh, linguistic capabilities, they have connections throughout the Mediterranean, uh, they might have wealth that they can also leverage and are also very good politically, ambassadors and so forth. So the Christian kingdom, I think the first one to do that is uh, King Alfonso, I believe it's, I can't remember if it's the 10th, maybe on here. Um, he basically says Jews are welcome to come, and, and again, Jewish uh, communities are protected, you can worship, you can have synagogues, you can function as these independent communities as long as you are uh, loyal to the king, and technically, the king is the one who owns the Jewish communities. They are his Jews. So they have like this, uh, uh, they're independent communities, but in some sense, they are directly King's property, if you will. So they're his, uh, under his control. Um, there's a whole list of things that happen uh, in the 1300s that begin to show the changes uh, politically to Jews. And I'll, I'll try to summarize them uh, and get us up to the point where we're, we're talking about uh, the last century of Jewish life. Can you start Okay, so another 15 minutes. So my goal is to sort of get to the point that we're right at the last stage, and then the next class really talk about the last 100 years, and then the next, the last two classes, I want to talk about individuals, like examples, and their stories, you know, what they endured, how they got out, it's, those stories are fascinating. So by the, by the 1300s, the Jewish community reached its height of uh, existence in the Iberian Peninsula. By the 1300s, um, there's one scholar who believes that Castile alone probably had something like 250,000 Jews, maybe 180 to 250,000 smaller groups in, in uh, the Kingdom of Aragon, smaller groups in Navarre, and then a smaller contingent in Portugal. But it's during this time in the 1300s where Jews are really uh, flourishing. Um, and at the same time, even as they're flourishing, they're reaching the point where that, that influence and that success is gonna begin to draw the attention of uh, Christian communities. Also, this is the age, the golden age of Spanish power. Yes, that's true. Uh, so in the, in, the, uh, in the middle of the 1300s, uh, 
there are a series of civil wars that take place in Castillo. Uh, and I was talking to Ark about this. Um, there is sort of the famous incident. There's a famous king whose name is King Pedro, uh, and his his uh, illegitimate brother or half brother uh, Henry de Castamada uh, is the one who wants to control the throne. Now King Pedro it is said had a Jewish paramour, so he he's said to have had a Jewish lover. Uh, he has a lot of Jews who are influential in his cabinet, so to speak, um, and. Uh, Basamara, uh, this is also in the midst of, uh, if you remember in the 1340s, 1349, we had the Ebonic Plague, the Black Plague. So, that, so there are many people that are dying throughout Europe, throughout Spain, and of course Jews are a natural target uh, to be blamed for the origin of the, uh, the plague. Well, we have less casualties because of our religious hygiene. So, so Jews become the focal point as, you know, they're the ones who instigate the, their you know, magic, they're poisoning the wells. There's all kinds of things, and Trasamada is very politically sound. He knows that he is the underdog against King Pedro, so what does he do? He says, this is really a religious war. We have to purify the kingdom, and the reason, and the way that we're going to do it is because we're going to target the Jews. So he joins up support for his attempt to overthrow uh, his half-brother by instigating hatred against Jews, and he's very successful with it. It takes him quite a bit of time. Uh, in the process, he attacks several Jewish communities and destroys them. Um, oftentimes, you know, Jews look to a strong king to be the defender of the Jewish community. Now, the more loyal they were to the king, the more vested were their future uh, status vested with that king. So then Henry the Trastamara comes and says, you need to be loyal to me. And the Jews say, well, we're loyal to the king. So he says, oh, so you're not gonna be loyal to me. Now I'm going to punish you because you weren't loyal to me. Now, of course, if they had done the reverse and had supported Trastamara, then, of course, King Pedro, if he had won, would have taken vengeance against the Jews for not being loyal. So the Jews are always caught sort of in this in-between situation, right? If we support the king, we don't support the king, there's always going to be some liability that we face. Uh, there's a series of attacks in different Jewish quarters. Many Jews are killed. Trastamara spreads essentially anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Judaism, and what that does is it it impacts the Jewish community significantly until by the end of the, the last 20 years of the 14th century, um, the the Cortes, which is essentially the Parliament, if you can think about it, they, they really didn't have that kind of power, but the, the equivalent of, it, of the Parliament in Spain, in Castile, begins to consider the Jewish question. And they begin to say, well, you know, the Jews are, you know, have been causing problems, even though they're, you know, they're the victims. What can we do to equalize the situation in Spain? And so they begin to look at old legislation that had been passed centuries before on how to identify Jews. Well, Jews need to wear distinctive clothes. Well, Jews need to be living in certain neighborhoods. They shouldn't be living in mixed neighborhoods with Muslims, and, because there's still a lot of Muslims, remember that. So there's, there's Muslims throughout uh, Aragon, there's Muslims. Um, uh, I think they're called Muldejadis. Uh, they lived in Castile. So there's Muslims, there's Jews, there's Christians, but it's always the focal point is on Jews. And I think part of that was because Christians were careful not to be too anti Muslim because they knew that there were Christians living in Granada. So if we take you know, too heavy a line against you know, Muslim civilians, Christians in Granada or Christians living in North Africa are going to be a question. Jews, they didn't really care. They were expendable. So the Cortes begins to consider legislation that had been passed sometime before, but for the most part, the kings would not put it into practice. Jews have to wear distinctive badges. You know, they cannot, uh, you know, occupy a certain position. What is most important is that in 1380, what the Cortes decides is that the rabbis do not have the ability to issue um, excommunication and they do not have a pharaoh, and they do not have the ability to uh, uh, legislate um, impose the death penalty. Now there was something called a, um, I can't remember the term. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a unique law that existed that an individual in, who was Jewish would never be permitted to essentially be a turncoat. What, what that meant is that if I'm a member of the Jewish community, I cannot go and go to the king and 
say that there are certain things happening in the Jewish community that are unfavorable to the king. The Jewish community had the ability to uh, enforce discipline. And so one of the things that, that, that Cortez does is the ability to take Pharaoh away and impose uh, death penalty and physical punishment is they're essentially decapitating and emasculating the rabbis who have an effective authority in their own communities. So the, the power base of the rabbis to legislate Exactly. So now the communities are less powerful. And if you think about it, um, you know, we live in the 21st century, so we think about religious freedom and people can do anything we want. But in the medieval period, you're, you're going to be a member of a community. It's going to be either Christianity or Islam or Judaism, whatever it is. And you are subject to the laws of that particular community. And the community has the ability to enforce those laws through physical punishment. This raises the question to me. I look at the IDF today, and we are fierce fighters. And so I ask myself, and I, and I, and I lead me to, to think of the commandments that thou shalt not burn, but I ask myself, how come throughout all these hundreds of years was there never risen an army of Jews who said, we're going to take land for ourselves and we're going to have our own small society in the places that we moved to? I'm like, how come this never happened in any of our Or it has any. Because every time we that we tried, we got smashed by a Muslim. Yeah, there there was some. Shem didn't allow it because he wanted to. Well, you know, there there was some debate about that. Yeah, 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 there was some debate about that. Uh, wrote a letter to, I think I talked about it last time, he, he heard about the bazaars and he wrote a letter to them and he was just, he, he was just beside himself because he said there's a, there's a kingdom in the east that uh, is a Jewish kingdom. This must be a, a sign essentially of a messianic gate. And of course there were many um, uh, traditions and, and uh, folklore about the lost tribes being beyond, you know, a certain river, some of them beyond, like that. And so it was always in the east, like just over the horizon. And so I think there were very limited cases where Jews uh, had independence limited. They did serve in the militaries, but I think that you know they had their ability maybe to coalesce sufficiently to establish an independent kingdom was probably very difficult. I have heard mentioned that in Egypt there was a it was like a community of Jewish mercenaries. Yes. Who even built their own temples. Yes. But they somehow were like, uh, well, they, that was uh, in elephant time. And that was something like in the, uh, would have been something like in the fifth or sixth century BCE. So they were serving as mercenaries under the Egyptians. So they had a, they had an island, I think, elephant time is like a river in the middle of the Nile. But, it was probably something relatively small. Um, so I think you could say that it was a sort of an independent enclave, but uh, I don't, you know, maybe like a little town or something like that. So it wouldn't be, you know, so like one of these city states. But was there a kingdom in Ethiopia or? Uh, yeah, so the Ethiopian Jews were in isolation from all of the rest of Judea. Oh, um, until the 1900s, most like the main body of Judaism in the whole world didn't really exist. Which is interesting for a bunch of reasons because when they were when they were found, they brought up the fact that in isolation they still kept to all of this halakha that went back to around the 1700s. 